Hello. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Can everybody hear me in the back? All right. Let's get started. Last year, I gave a talk about why I wanted to start porting LibreSVG from C to Rust. This time, I hope to tell you how, a bit of how we have been doing that, now that uh, I know Rust a lot, of, a lot better, and now we actually have a team. This is no longer a one-man shop. For those who don't know, this is Ferris. She's the official Rust mascot. And I'll repeat what I said last year. I don't want it to be 2018 and be using a language that doesn't have a cute mascot. So uh, I see a lot of old timers here. So for the few new people in the audience, LibreSVG Liber Liber is really old. It started in 2001. Uh, it takes an SVG file and it renders it to a Cairo context. That's all it does. Uh, it's used in a bunch of places. GNOME, Wikipedia uses it to render their SVG diagrams, Enlightenment, Emacs. Uh, image Magic, the way Image Magic can render SVGs is through LibreSVG. And people use it for all sorts of random stuff. Uh, we have a team now. I'm very, very happy to have people working on LibreSVG. Uh, Ivan Molodetsky, she's my Summer of Code intern. He's converting the filter effects from C to Rust. He's there. Give him a big applause. Uh, is Jordan here? No, he maybe stayed in the other room. Anyway, Jordan has been doing our continuous integration infrastructure and porting some of the Rust code too. Paolo Borelli, one of the really, really old timers in GNOME, has been converting a lot of the LibreSVG internals to Rust. I'm very happy for that. He used to be the gedit maintainer. And uh, a bunch of people doing excellent work here. Most of you use LibreSVG probably without noticing the way we render SVG icons, the application icons, the decorations in the, in the windows. Uh, that's with LibreSVG. It happens behind the scenes. The API is very minimal. And the way, uh, the, the only one rule we have for the Rust port is we don't want to break existing code. Code should keep working with no changes to the API or to the ABI. People who distribute LibreSVG, on the other hand, I'm sure they have seen changes in their workflow and, their, and had their workflow disturbed. I'm sorry that distros had to start including LibreSVG, I mean uh, Rust, into their tool chains. Anytime we in distros need to include a new programming language tool chain, it's a major, major pain in the ass. Rust is not an exception. So I feel, I feel your pain. We've been doing this at SUSE, and it's just as painful as anywhere else. Firefox is pretty much compelling us to have a Rust tool chain. I'm not complaining. I just wish somebody else was doing it. But anyway, uh, LibreSVG is 20-year-old code. Uh, it was being written while the SVG spec was being written. So there's a lot of loose ends in there. Uh, lots of ambiguities in the spec had to be resolved in the code. Uh, lots of unfinished parts of the spec had to be decided what to do in the code. LibreSVG comes, from, comes uh, before the time we had Cairo. We used a library called Libres, uh, Libart before Cairo, and it was very, very clunky. LibreSVG got ported from Libart to Cairo, so there's some Libart-isms in there still. Uh, we had a Mozilla plugin. Before Mozilla could render SVGs on its own, LibreSVG provided a plugin to, to do it inside the browser. It crashed all the time. We no longer have that, fortunately. We even had a GTK theme engine based on SVGs. And now that uh, GTK is kind of sort of scalable, we don't need that anymore. I got this book a few months ago. And it's really good. Uh, it has a ton of uh, techniques for refactoring code that doesn't have any tests and doesn't have any documentation, for refactoring it gradually into something that you can understand and that uh, 
that you can write tests for. Everybody, everybody who has to write tests for code that is very interconnected knows how hard that can be. So this book has a lot of tips for how to unravel it. Uh, ask me later if you want to learn where to get a copy, wink, wink. Uh, so, Libra SVG is not really a typical GNOME library. Our API, our public API is very minimal. It consists of a single very small G object. Unlike, say, GTK, which exports, you know, tons and tons of G objects. Internally, we don't just use G object, we just use plain structs in C. Uh, we use libxml2 to, to parse the XML in the SVGs. We use libcroco to parse CSS. We use a lot of Cairo. We don't do any fancy I.O., just, uh, you know, read a file. Uh, and not even that, because most of the time we just plug to a GIO stream and that's that. We don't have threads. We don't have objects. Your code in GNOME might, might be very, very different, so take this talk with a grain of salt and expect some differences if you've tried to port other code to, to Rust. Uh, one point I want to make in this talk is that you don't need to know a code base very well to start improving it or to start refactoring it or porting it. I practically didn't know the LibRSVG code when I started maintaining it. I had done a few random bug fixes in the past, but they were very, very localized. You know, fix a memory leak or fix this array index, but I didn't really know the code. And uh, I want to... Uh, I want to reassure you that if you start refactoring some code gradually using standard refactoring techniques, uh, you will get to understanding it eventually. So keep that in mind. So the general strategy if you want to port uh, a C library to Rust is get the build system going first. Feel free to copy and paste all the auto tools crap we have in LibRSVG to, to build a Rust library and link it with your main C library, that's boilerplate. Uh, there's some work being done in, in using Meson, but it's not finished yet. Uh, porting computation only code is a lot easier than porting code which uses a lot of API calls. And uh, Rust lets you wrap uh, unsafe C APIs. What does unsafe mean here? Unsafe means that they have to ref the reference random pointers, they don't have any guarantees to the they don't have any preconditions, or they don't, don't let you encode preconditions. If you wrap that with safe Rust APIs, people who are learning Rust will come to terms with safety and unsafety. Uh, that works very well. And uh, finally, opaque pointers and opaque structures, they are your best friends. They let you have an opaque structure in C that gets accessed from Rust, or an opaque structure in Rust that gets accessed from C, and that works really, really well. Uh, I, this, this is a slide from last year's talk. So we use auto tools in LibreSVG. We build two libraries, the main C library and the Rust internals library, and then we link the Rust internals library into the C part. Uh, it's auto tools trickery, so just feel free to copy and paste stuff. We, we can look at this in details later. I have a musical interlude without music because I'm sure uh, none of you will have any problems imagining the music, so. All right. So just imagine the music in your head, I'm sure you know it.
right. All right, let's begin with the code. Uh, there, there is something we have done a couple of times in LibreSVG, and basically we have these massive structs full of data, you know? And uh, one thing that worked very well was to start moving field by field from the C struct into a Rust struct. So let's look at how to do that. This thing, RSVG state, does this have, does this have a pointer? No, okay. RSVG state is a big structure that holds the CSS uh, properties for each element in the SVG file. So for example, down here, if you have a rectangle element, x, y with height, stroke is black, you paint the, you outline the rectangle in black, stroke width is two pixels. That value of two gets reflected in the stroke width uh, field over there, and there's a Boolean that called has, stroke width, because all the properties can be omitted from the elements, but uh, you know the code needs to know if the property was specified or not, so we used to store a Boolean there. Uh, RSVG state also has some independent fields that uh, sometimes come directly from SVG elements, and sometimes they, they get computed afterwards. In this case, there was a transform uh, property that sometimes gets used just like that and sometimes gets uh, multiplied by the previous transformation, so there were some independent fields up there. The general thing to do is on the C side of things, we added accessors for those, func uh, for those fields so that the code uh, didn't use the, field, the struct fields directly, instead they called some functions. We have all done this with, with the objects before. So the first thing to do was to, to make all the code use accessors instead of accessing fields directly. This makes the code a lot more verbose initially, but in the end, when it's on the Rust side, it will become nice and small again. This, it, this is just a, a temporary stage. So let's start draining the struct. What do we do? We add a field that is a pointer to an opaque structure that will live on the Rust side. Every field, we will drain it through that little hole. We start with an empty struct in Rust. We have a state Rust over there in the right. We provide two functions, one to allocate it, one to free it. This is just like, uh, the first one is just like calling g new. The second one is like calling g free. The exception is that we do it on the Rust side. We take our empty structure and we move the first field to it. In LibreSVG, uh, since we had this uh, field, has field, field, has field thing, we were able to replace it with a Rust option. So for example, uh, Fill rule, it specifies how you fill an object in the SVG, in the SVG image. Uh, so we replaced has fill rule with option fill rule. Uh, you may need to define your own types if, uh, if, if you port them from C whenever they are not available in things like Cairo or, and stuff. Here, uh, Cairo already provides a Cairo fill rule T type. That already had a binding in the Cairo Rust binding, so we were just able to use that. And then we also add accessors on the Rust side for the Rust field. And later those accessors can be called from the C code. So uh, we provide two functions, uh, state Rust has fill rule, which unpacks the struct, uh, which sees if the option is none or has a value. And a state Rust get fill rule, which actually gets you the value if you are sure it's there. These functions take a pointer to a state Rust, but they return C values because we are gonna be calling them from the C side. So we don't return a Rust bool, instead we return a G boolean. Those types have different sizes. Uh, Cairo fill rule is an enum that is represented the same in C as in Rust, so we can just pass it around. On the C side, we remove the fields from the struct because they are in the Rust side now. 
and we replace the accessor that we wrote initially with a call to the Rust side accessor. Now, this might seem like too much in direction. You know, I'm calling an accessor from C that calls an accessor from Rust that accesses the field that returns the value, that returns the value that the code can use. It's a lot of indirection, but all of that will go away. Don't worry about that. We do the same for the clip rule and has clip rule. We remove the C version, stroke, stroke opacity. Same thing for every pair of fields we had here, etc. for all the remaining fields. And now we only have a few remaining fields in the C struct on the left. Uh, my daughter has been learning watercolors and I ask her, can you draw me fairies moving baskets from one place to another? There you go. Uh, let's fix that ugly white space, let's move everything up. So the C struct is much tinier now that it has very few fields. Now we go back to the fields that are different, the, the individual ones. So I had to do a lot of refactoring to be able to move this field into the Rust code because of the way affine transformations get uh, computed, but it's just you know standard refactoring. We move it to Rust. We remove it from C. Here's the C side accessor for the affine transformations. It just calls uh, state Rust get affine. Here's the Rust side accessor that returns the real value. So we uh, convert the pointer to the struct to a reference so that we can use it, and then we just return the value. After all the fields are moved, we ported the code that actually uses them from C to Rust. We, here we were porting the fields and adding accessors for them. The next step was to actually port the code that uses those values, the drawing code, you know? Give me the field rule, set it on the Cairo context, and draw whatever paths we need to draw. Uh, but on the Rust side of things, we were porting the drawing code to Rust. How do we access the Rust fields since we only have a C structure with a pointer to a Rust structure inside. How do we do that? What we have to do is, th this is what the Rust side of things look like, looks like. Uh, we want to be passed a pointer from C to, a C to the original C structure. We want to extract the pointer to the Rust structure that lives inside the C structure. And, uh, you know, from Rust's viewpoint, this is an opaque structure that lives in the C world. So we use an empty enum, an, an empty enum RSVG state, just to be able to take a pointer to it. We export a function on the C side called RSVG state get state Rust, which, given a pointer to an RSVG state struct which lives in C, it will give us back a pointer to the uh, state rust struct. This comes from the state rust field down there. We create a helper function, state get rust, which gives, gives me the, the, the rust side of the struct. And any drawing function that needs to access one of the CSS properties when it has a pointer to the C state will call this function to get to the rust fields. It takes a pointer to an RSVG state, which comes from somewhere in the C code, returns a reference to a state Rust, calls a function that we exported from C to get that pointer. And now, whenever we port one of the drawing functions that takes in a pointer to the RSVG state struct, we first, score, we first call state get Rust to get the Rust side of things, and we can access the fields normally. So all the accessors that we added before start going away. Because once we port the drawing code, we don't need accessors for the individual fields. We just need, we just need the, the master accessor to access the whole struct. In the end, we won't be taking raw pointers to C structures since everything will live completely in the Rust side. 
and we will uh, be able to access Rust fields directly without first calling a helper function, so the code becomes nice and small again. Once we have all the code, once we have ported all the code that actually used those struct fields, the C struct becomes empty. We can remove it, and we can rename our Rust structure to be the one and only one. This is not state Rust anymore. This is called just state. And I have not found a good way to make this change easily in a single step, because once you rename this thing, you need to convert the functions that you use to allocate this and free it and change all the Rust code at once to use the new the new struct. And the compiler will complain a lot about ownership and this and that, but that's just taking each error message and fixing it. It takes, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a stressful couple of hours because your code doesn't compile. But uh, once you are done fixing all the compiler errors, like, oh, here I was taking a mutable reference while I needed an immutable one, or vice versa. Once you fix all of those, the code works. The compiler is very good at catching mistakes. And anyway, uh, when we're in the middle of this kind of refactoring, do you remember when we had the part of, part of the struct in C and part of the struct in Rust? Well, this is what the code looks like when we are in that intermediate state. Uh, first, we obtain a state which comes from somewhere else in the code, and it, it's a pointer to a C struct. We get the Rust part of the structure. We can use some fields if they have moved already to Rust, we can use them directly. Otherwise, we need to add accessors. And it's kind of horrible that for some fields we can access them directly, and for some fields we need accessors. Let me promise you, this is fine. This is okay. All those ugly accessors will go away in the end, as we saw. So don't get too stressed about the fact that your code is very verbose in some parts and very nice in some others. It will all become nice in the end if you keep doing the refactoring sequence. Uh, you may, if you have used uh, Rust before, you may be asking, what about Repr C? Repr C is the pragma that Rust uses to say, hey, this structure should have the same memory layout in C as in Rust so that we can just pass it around by value. That works very well. That, wor that really works very well. In LibRSVG, we only use this for very small shared structs that get passed around all, all the time, like small values. For example, we have a RSVG length value. And a length value in, in SVG is just uh, five pixels or three centimeters or two points. They, they are very small values, like uh, a number and a, and a unit. The unit can be pixels, centimeters, inches, whatever. Those get passed around all the time, so it's better to have a shared representation between C and Rust. But for massive structures with many, many types that don't have a counterpart in C, like the state Rust we had, I, I, I have found it better to just use accessors. Uh, now, how do we refactor the first pass of conversion into beautiful Rust code. The first pass you, of conversion gives you very ugly code. It looks similar to C, but with Rust syntax, and it's kind of ugly. So how, how do we fix that? I have found that refactoring Rust is a really pleasant experience. Rust refactors very nicely because we have a very, very strict compiler. It won't let you have mistakes like, uh, like if you rename a struct in C, and you pass a pointer to it in a function, or if you add an argument to a function, sometimes the C compiler will only warn you, you know, incompatible pointer type, but it will go on compiling, like everything is just fine. And uh, that's not ideal, you know? If you're passing a uh, an argument with the wrong pointer type, it's probably a bug. And if it's not, then it means that you really know what you're doing with C and it's kind of scary. Uh, so let me show you how we refactored some verbose code into very simple and powerful Rust code. This is one of the CSS properties, line join. Line join is how, uh, if you have two lines that join in a vertex, is that vertex rounded? Does it have a chopped off uh, a point? 
this, the SVG specification says that the default for the line join property is miter, so you have two lines joined and they get cut off. Uh, so we implement the default trait for this type to say that, oh, the default value is, is, is miter. We also need to parse that property. Uh, the, ignore the API for this parser, just that means if the string I got passed is miter, miter between quotes, then I return a value of stroke line join colon colon miter. It's just a, you know, parsing a symbol, you know? There's many properties like that. Here's another similar property, this time called uh, line cap. Line cap is how the endpoints of lines look. Are they square, are they rounded? The SVG spec says that the, def that the default is but, which is awesome. And uh, that looked very similar to the previous property, so we refactored it to use a Rust macro instead of cutting and pasting the same code to parse symbols. So we have a make identifier property macro which takes the name of the type we are parsing. We specify the default. The default is still but. Uh, and we, we made up a little syntax to say if it's this string then use this symbol value. If it's this string, use the symbol value. So that's very legible. Even if you don't, uh, even if you're not familiar with SVG, I'm sure you can figure out kind of what that thing is doing. Uh, Rust macros are very, very powerful. They let you define a little syntax within the body of the macro. Uh, they are hygienic. That means that you don't have problems like, uh, you know, in C macros when you have to pass everything in parentheses to avoid captures, to avoid, uh, uh, you know, errors with operator precedence. Rust doesn't have that problem because it actually knows how to do hygienic macros. So we were able to compress all the cut and pasted code to define individual properties into macro calls, and that's very nice. Later, the macro evolved to support properties that are not just uh, strings and symbols. For example, here we have a, a call to create the stroke opacity property. Stroke opacity has a default value of one, that is, it's fully opaque. And for the opacity property, we use a type called unit interval. Unit interval is a type in LibreSVG which can represent values just from zero to one in that closed range. And uh, it knows that the SVG spec says that if the user specifies values outside the zero, one range, it should just clip them, you know? So unit interval knows how to do that in its parsing stage. So that's why we have a new type for that. So it's, it's, it makes the code uh, easy to read. The macro evolved a lot. Uh, it's even able to define properties that are not simple symbols or simple numbers. For example, there's a uh, text decoration property which can take tons of different sub-values and they get aggregated into a struct. You know, the macro can now process this, so it's very legible how to do that. Thank you. Uh, once we finished shaving yaks in the yak shaving boutique, uh, let me show you an example of turning C code that use iterators into Rust. Here we are extracting key value pairs uh, from a property, property bag. We parse the values and we stop if, if we find an error during parsing. First, we initialize a Boolean value for success. We create an, iter an iterator on at, which is attributes, which is a property bag. While everything is okay, and there is an extra item in the iterator, get the key value pair from the iterator, try to parse it, update our success value. At the end, free the iterator. If we found an error, the C code didn't really have a good way of propagating that error upstream. So I decided to wait until we ported that code to Rust to actually do our propagation properly because it would be easier there. The Rust version is very small. It's a small for loop for each key attribute value tuple in the property bags iterator, parse the value, return an error value if the parsing is not successful, 
otherwise return OK. How do we expose that iterator to C? Well, opaque structures. Let's say we have an object called foo with an iter method that gives me back an iterator to look inside the object that returns a foo iter. The details of how foo iter is implemented are not really important here, it's just uh, whatever you would use to iterate within your, your foo object. And it holds your iterator state, like uh, if you were iterating in an array, the iterator state would just be the current index, you know? Uh, Rust asks us to implement the iterator trait for foo iter. We specify the type of item that the iterator will return. In this case, it's called my item, it's just an example. We implement the next method for iterator. Rust iterators return an option on the type you specified. And the option is sum my type if we have a next item, otherwise we return none if there are no more elements in the iterator. Let's expose this to C. We create a foo iter begin function visible from C. This will allocate an iterator on the Rust side and pass it on to the C side and return a pointer. It takes a raw pointer to the object we want to iterate on, returns a pointer to the iterator. We check that we didn't get past an old pointer, convert the raw pointer to a reference, call its iter method. We put the iterator object in the heap by boxing it. This is just like calling gnu or gmalloc. And finally, we return a raw pointer to the value in the heap. Now let's implement the next function, iter next. It's callable from C, so it's extern C. Takes a pointer to the iterator. Takes a pointer to the location where we will write the value we got from the iterator. And returns a boolean that says whether there was an item or not. We check the arguments. We get a reference to the iterator. If the actual Rust side iterator returns an item, we copy the item to the output location and we return true in gboolean form. Otherwise, we zero out the output value so C won't get uninitialized data. And we return false, convert to a glib value. That means that we didn't have an item to return. Finally, to free the iterator from C, we expose a function called iter end checks its argument, and frees the boxed iterator on the heap by doing box from raw. And we have now an iterator implemented in Rust with a nice API that we can call from C. Sometimes uh, I found it useful to do printf-based debugging. GDB is great, but printf is forever. Uh, as a word of warning, I don't know exactly what was going on, but uh, printf doesn't always seem to flush standard output when you call it. But Rust's println macro always flushes standard out. So I had to, to make the fucking logging work, I had to insert an f flush call after every printf in C. So keep that in mind. Uh, here, I, uh, for the example I'm going to give you, I wanted to trace some complicated code flow, see which functions were getting called and which arguments they were receiving to be able to see uh, the difference between the old C code and the new, the new Rust code. Something wasn't matching in there, and I wanted to see exactly where my arguments were getting, getting wrong. So I, needed, I really needed some nesting, some indentation. You, you're seeing it from the other side. I really need some nesting in my logging. So the simplest hack was to output my stuff within parentheses, like if it were a Lisp, uh, uh, a Lisp expression in parentheses. The raw output is horrible. It looks like this. But I was able to load that into my text editor and indent it with, a, with one keystroke, and that made it very nice to read. So that's a, that's a little hack you can use if you want to add logging with indentation very quickly without adding a whole logging framework that knows how to deal with indentation and this and that. This made it possible to find the mismatch quickly. So, you know, it's a useful thing to have around. Finally, how are we doing? 
This is the programming languages chart that GitLab is able to display. You can, I mean, if you have a project in GitLab, you can use this chart. We have more Rust code than C code these days, thanks to, thanks to that man over there. So give him an applause again. Uh, the C part of LibRSVG is shrinking very, very quickly because the only remaining parts are the, a few filters, the XML parsing code, which calls into libxml, the CSS parsing code, which calls into libcroco, and just the general uh, loading machinery that plugs into GIO stream. There's not very much C code left. It's just a lot of uh, API calls and boilerplate. So that will shrink very, very quickly. I want to point you to a number of useful resources if you want to port C code to Rust. The first one is a talk by Carol Nichols. She's one of the authors of the Rust programming language book, the Rust Manual. She, as an exercise, she ported Zopfli, which is a data compression library from C to Rust. She has a fantastic talk on how to do that. She had exactly the same problems as with LibRSVG. Old, undocumented code, without tests, kind of convoluted. She didn't know anything about the compression algorithm beforehand, just like I didn't know anything about SVG beforehand. And it's just the same, just refactoring and porting bit by bit, bit by bit. And whenever you don't know how to test something, you see what the C code does, you encode that in a test in Rust, and there you go. Uh, there's a new tool, c2rust.com. It's an automatic translator from C to Rust. It's very, very sophisticated stuff. It works, and it gives you Rust code that is absolutely horrible. <laughs> but it's reasonably easy to refactor. Why is it horrible? Because in C, we the reference pointers all the time. We have shared pointers to everything from everywhere, and Rust really doesn't like that. So uh, the way these translators work is by doing a lot of unsafe calls in Rust to the reference pointers directly. So later, it's your job to refactor that into Rust references and immutable structures and mutable structures. But at least it gets you started. It's, it's very interesting stuff. They can even handle complicated go-tos and breaks and stuff. It's, it's really cool. Finally, Katrina Owens refactoring talks are absolutely amazing. Uh, they are mostly for Golang and Ruby. But they, they really get you into the refactoring mindset that you can gradually turn code into, into much better looking code. <laughs> Thanks to my daughter for the first drawings. Uh, she's delighted to know that you are all seeing them. Uh, Katrina for the technique of narrating code by highlighting it. Uh, Alberto, uh, my friend Joaquin, Mexico, and Zishan for organizing the previous GNOME and Rust Hackfests. Uh, the Rust Beginners channel on IRZ Mozilla is really, really friendly. That got me started. Uh, Jordan Petridis for making our CI infrastructure and doing some of the initial Rust uh, debugging. Paolo Borelli, the previous gedit maintainer for porting a shitload of code from C to Rust. He's been, he's been doing, doing it on the weekends because he has real work to do in the week now. But don't worry, he's uh, starting to use his night time for programming Rust as well. Um, thanks to Paolo, he's converted a lot of code. Uh, there, in my blog, there's two tags for all this work. One is the libRSVG tag, the other one is the Rust tag. You can use them to see my ramblings. And that's all I have. Thank you.